And thank you, praise team, or should I say our little mini choir for, for leading us in worship this morning. Um, that was good. So leading us right into worship, and, and uh, I love that last song because we're going to talk a little bit about that, about uh, let me tell you about my Jesus, right? So, and how he changed his lives, and we're going to see that this morning. So this morning we're still in our sermon series in Mark. We're in chapter 5, and uh, Julie's read the text already for us this morning, and though even though Mark is the shortest of all the gospel accounts, it's still chock full of like interesting details pertaining to Jesus' life. And it also serves as a guide for us as believers as we live life in the world today. Because it's through the four gospels, Mark included, that we can come to know Jesus in an intimate way. That is, we can know about Jesus. Uh, and what we can know about Jesus, it isn't hearsay, right? It's not like... Uh, it isn't someone's opinion or, or somebody's opinion of the written biography concerning Jesus. The gospel of Mark, uh, the gospels as a whole, are, are actual factual accounts of Jesus' life and, and while he was here on earth. And even though that was around like 2,000 years ago, we can still through his word come to know him, come to know him as our Lord and Savior, and, come, and, and we can also know him more and live like him and do the things that he wants us to do. And this morning's text is no exception. As I said, Julie read for us already the passage uh, this morning that she read. And the passage itself, kind of an odd little passage here, um, in, that, in that, you know, it, it doesn't seem like it would contain anything for us today, right? It's like this was happened 2,000 years ago. There's all this other stuff going on. Uh, Jesus was here on earth at that time, and now it's different because Jesus is in heaven. Uh, we also see Jesus and his disciples at the seashore, and he's, he's approached by this man that's possessed by a demon, and, and that's different now as well, right? Or is it? We're going to get into that. Let's dig into the passage to see how this encounter can help us in our lives today. And I guarantee you that we will get some things out of this for our lives today. Mark 5.1. They went across the sea, across the lake, to the region of the Gerasenes, where Jesus got out of a boat. A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons of his, on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. And what we see here is Jesus' encounter with this man, with a man, right? And, and Jesus was always having encounters with people. So this is like nothing out of the ordinary. Jesus encountered people every day. Some of the encounters that Jesus had with people, some of them went very well. And... Some of those encounters didn't go very well. As, like, for instance, some of the, the, the meetings that he had with the Jewish religious leaders. And this meeting, this encounter is certainly different than any of the other ones we have seen so far. It's different than any of the other ones we have, we have seen before. We are told and we've seen that Jesus had been going around and, and preaching and teaching uh, people about the kingdom of God. That was chapter 4 and 3 and all of that. We've already been there. He's going through the region of Galilee at that point. He's healing people of their illnesses and their, and their, their, their handicaps and, and whatever else ailed them. And we also know that in his ministry in, in Galilee, Jesus was also casting out demons from people. So this is nothing new. But this encounter is just a little bit different than those. It's a little bit different than those other meetings. First of all, Jesus and his disciples are no longer in the region of Galilee. They have sailed at night across the sea uh, of Galilee into the region of Decapolis. And more specifically, the area of Gadara. Some translations say the, the area of the Gerasenes. Some call it the country of Gadara. Uh, the Gadarenes, there's all the same place, whatever your translation says here in the Bible, all the same place. This area is southeast of where Jesus was in chapter 4. It's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And the biggest difference is that this region, this area that they're in, is not a Jewish region. 
This is a, a totally Gentile area. This is not a Jewish region like Galilee or Judea. This is a total Gentile area. All this to say there has not been any Jewish influence here. See, the talk of the town over in Galilee and Judea was Jesus, right? Everybody knew about Jesus. Jesus, the, the son of a carpenter, he's going around, he's doing amazing things, he's healing people, he's teaching like nobody else has ever taught. He's doing some really amazing things. But here on the east side, on the, on the other side of the sea, on the other side of the track, so to speak, the people have not heard about Jesus yet. But they're soon going to find out about him. Here's what we need to remember before we go any further. At this point, Jesus has been on this boat all day and all night. He was on this boat when he taught over there in, in Galilee. They sailed at night. He taught all day. They sailed at night across the sea. There came that big storm, right? We, we, we went there last week and we learned about that. Uh, the storm arose, and, and Jesus was trying to get a little sleep during that time. They, oh, they had to wake him up, and he had to take care of that. So they get to this new region across the lake, and as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, as soon as he gets out of the boat, a man with the evil spirit came out of the caves to meet him. Now, anybody that's ever been in a boat for like a day, right, or, or just on a fishing trip for, for the whole day, any length of time, you have what, then you, what is known as sea legs, right? Like you get out of the boat, it still feels like you're on the boat, like, you know, it's like the whole thing is still moving, and, and your, your legs, it takes a while uh, for that feeling to go away. Those are sea legs. Jesus didn't even have enough time to get his legs under him, and this guy runs out of the cave to meet him. And what we can know about this man, because this is important to know what this man was about. We don't know his official name. We're going to see a name here shortly. But what we can know about this man is that he was an outcast. He's an outcast. Now, here's one area, one particular part where we can apply this story here, this passage here, to lives today. Because we have in our world many people who are outcast. This man was alone. Just like many people are today, he was ostracized and hated by his own people. He was no longer welcomed to live in the community. Now, just like it is today, though, he obviously suffered like this because of the actions he had done. This man had an evil spirit. He was demon-possessed. And some of the horrible, horrendous, terrible things that we see people do in our world today is because some people are demon-possessed. They are evil. But also notice here, no one is too evil to meet Jesus. No one else would have anything to do with this man, but Jesus met him where he, where he was. Why? Because even though he had an evil spirit, even though he'd probably done some really terrible things to people in that community and to himself, He's still a human being. He's still created in the image of God. He's still valuable to Jesus. He is still redeemable. Here's the thing. In today's culture, it's easy to point out the terrible things that some people do. It's easy to write off a person and not have anything to do with them because even, even because they don't think like I think anymore, right? There's this great divide within our, within our, our country and within our world. If you think this way, I don't want anything to do with you. If you think that way, you leave me alone, right? And maybe some of those people that, you know, that we deal with that we think aren't thinking clearly, maybe they are evil. But maybe they've just been taught to be evil because they've been influenced by the ways of the devil here in the world, right? He's the ruler of this world, and so his influence goes around. But they're still human beings. They're still creating the image of God. Everyone is still redeemable. But this guy came out of the cave to meet Jesus. And he's no weakling. In fact, he was physically strong. Look at this. Verse 3. This man lived in the tombs, 
No one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been, often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Physically strong. I mean, that's some superhuman strength right there. But as we're going to see, Jesus is stronger. See, most people would have been afraid of this guy. Anyone could, who could break metal chains, it, it's not someone you want to mess with, right? You don't want to mess with somebody like that. I mean, if you can just, boom, right? Break those chains. But Jesus didn't waver. He didn't turn, tuck his tail, and run away. Jesus knew what this guy was capable of, but that didn't stop him from meeting this man. So right here, let's just get over the notion that Jesus was a wimp. And what I mean by that is, you know, in movies or pictures or what, you know, whatever we see, you know, Jesus is always a gentle, almost effeminate guy, skinny arms and long flowing hair and a white robe and he's walking through and, and that's the way Jesus is portrayed in, our, in movies and pictures and things like that. But more than likely, Jesus was built. He was a manly man. He, he couldn't have been a leader over a bunch of, of seasoned fishermen if he didn't, wasn't physically to their standards, right? Before he began his ministry, at the age of 30, he was a carpenter. More, more, more than likely, probably, he was referred to being a stonemason. He lifted heavy boulders up and built walls. All this to point out that even though Jesus is God, he's fully human as well. And any man that would happen upon this raging lunatic would have been afraid, but not Jesus. But here's another area that we can point to to connect the points to today. Although this man was super strong, although he was physically strong beyond all comparison, he was, fit, he was spiritually weak. And this is also the condition of the majority of, of people in the world today. I mean, people can work out and they can have great bodies and they can be super strong, like they lift weights and stuff like that, but they are weak in other areas. I was never much of a weightlifter, and as you can tell, I've never been a person who worked out much. But when I worked a machine shop, I could lift a plate of steel and move it just as well as the guy that went to the gym every day. When I worked at Bob Evans' restaurant, I dug post holes just as quick as the guy that was twice my size. Now, I'm not bragging about that, but I'm just making a point that it's sometimes not just brute strength, but in the way you do things that gets the jobs done. In our spiritual life, it can also be that way as well. What I'm saying is, you can look super spiritual. You can memorize the Bible from front to back, and you can quote it. You can teach a Sunday school lesson, but if you don't know how to apply the Word of God to your life, it does you no good. You're spiritually built, but you don't know how to use it. You don't know how to use what you got. This man here in Mark 5 can literally break chains no matter how many they put on him. No matter where they place him, hands, feet, wherever they put it, he can break them. He can snap them like they're nothing. He, can, he's, he is physically strong enough to do that, but he cannot break the demon. He's spiritually weak. He can do all that, but he's not strong enough for that. He's physically strong and spiritually weak. And get this. He is powerless. Absolutely powerless. He can do nothing about his situation unless Jesus steps in. In his weakness, he needs Jesus to intervene. And, and you know what? We are all just like this man. Physically, we may be able to do anything we want. But spiritually, we can't do anything and here's the fact, you cannot save yourself, no matter how hard you try. And maybe you're here this morning and you've been thinking about this. Like, I know, I, I know something was to happen to me. Like, if something was to happen to me and I would die, I'd be in trouble. Because I cannot for, physically force my way into heaven. I cannot save myself. And you can't. But Jesus can. As we're going to see, he can do anything. He can even confront a real demon. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want me with me, Jesus, son of the high, most high God? 
Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. So as a man, Jesus is bold enough to stand up to this man and this evil spirit. But as God, he is powerful enough to have dominion over and have authority over this obviously powerful demon. Or demons, as as we're going to see. And Jesus confronts this demon. And we see some very interesting things here. First, as it appears, there's an apparent struggle going on between this man and this evil spirit. This man is living in the caves. He's screaming, he's yelling, he's tearing up the town, he's, he's torching himself, he's cutting himself. He's, day and night, he's just causing all kinds of trouble. And when he sees Jesus, he runs to Jesus. He runs to Jesus. He knows Jesus is his only help. So the man wants Jesus. And the evil spirit inside knows that Jesus is the only way he can be hurt. The man knows Jesus is my only way, my only hope. The this, this evil spirit knows Jesus is the only one that can hurt me. But I think the most interesting part is that this evil spirit knew Jesus. No introductions were necessary. Jesus didn't need to say to this man, uh, you know, good morning, how you doing? My name's Jesus, can I help you? No, as soon as the man saw Jesus, he ran up to him, he bowed before him, and the evil spirit began throwing a tantrum. It was like the man was in control for at least part of the time, and then this demon, or group of demons took over and spoke through the man. This is a very tormented man. I want you to know, I I can't prove this, but it just seems to me that the people we see that scream and holler and carry on and because they don't get their way in society anymore or whatever it may be, they're tortured people. They're hurting people. There's something inside of them that that is not that is that is unhappy. And that's why they they scream out and they, they throw fits. Right here, so is this demon. He's tormented because Jesus is going to flex his authority. He's going to show this demon who the boss really is. In verse 7, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. I like the way the New Living Translation says it. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, do not torture me. In other words, the evil spirit says, Jesus, why are you here? Why are you here messing with me? Why don't you just leave me alone? As I said in my introduction, I assume all that Jesus had been doing over in Galilee and Judea had not made its way over here to the, across the sea yet, but yet this evil spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. He knew exactly what Jesus intended to do. I read some commentaries that said that the evil spirit called Jesus by name in an attempt to control Jesus. That is, uh, I guess in an exorcism, I don't know, I've never done one, but in an exorcism, if you use the, the spirit's name or the person's name, you can control them. And that's how you, you get control over, over an evil spirit. He tried to flip the tables and turn the tide on Jesus. I don't know if that's the case or not, but the fact is, before Jesus had a chance to say or do anything, the demon's throwing a fit. And what we see here, and what I've seen in in my own experience, and what we've seen in our own experience, is that evil never wants to concede. Evil never quits. Evil never surrenders. Satan himself will fight to the bitter end until the day that he's thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity, even though he knows right now he's already lost. He's still going to fight. And we see this in some people that are in control of our world today. Let me tell you, behind the scenes of many things that are happening right now in our world is evil people being controlled by demonic beings. And I'm not saying there's a demon behind every bush or shrub or whatever, but it is surely evident that this world is under the influence of Satan. That we can see that the evil has infiltrated every area of, of, our, of our world, from our, 
our governments, to our institutions, to everything that we see here, all the world systems. Yes, unfortunately, even our own government, right? And the thing is we see here is evil never quits. It never gives up. But one day when Jesus will return, he'll finally take care of all this evil. And on that day, he will make all things new. That's where our hope lies. That's what we as believers trust in, isn't it? Revelation 20, verse 7 says, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they will be like the sand on the seashore. At the second coming of Jesus, Satan and his demons will be put into prison. Jesus will set up a thousand-year millennial kingdom right here on earth. At the end of those thousand years, Satan will be set free. He'll give it another go. There'll be one more battle, and he will never concede. Continuing in Revelation 20, they marched across the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of God's people, the city that he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's, that's the end of it. That's the end of all this evil. See, this demon, this evil spirit named Legion, was once an angel. And when Satan rebelled and fell and came to earth, one-third of the angels went along with him. Legion was one of them, or as the name implies, was many of them. And not only does evil never want to concede but, and surrender, but pure evil has been on destruction. Look at verse 10. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go to, into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd went about, heard about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. They were destroyed. This is an amazing story. This is like a front row at a boxing match, a front, front row seat at a spiritual boxing match, where we get to see the inner workings of God and the power that he has over evil. And now just a side note, this episode is also found in Luke chapter 8. And, and in Luke chapter 8, we get one more little detail where he tells Jesus his name is Legion because we are many demons. And they begged him repeatedly not to go to the abyss. The abyss is that prison that, the, the, where the, they were going to be locked up. The abyss is the prison that God has set up for fallen angels and for Satan for those thousand years. The many demons here beg Jesus, don't send us to prison. Don't send us to the abyss. If we must leave this man, then allow us to go into the pigs over there. I want you to notice something right here. This is very important. We talked about this in Bible group this morning too. Jesus is helping the man. He's showing grace to the man. By his power, Jesus is saving this man. He's changing his life. This man's life will never be the same again. But the demons, Jesus isn't attempting to save them at all. He's not changing them in any way. There will always be demons. They will always rebel. They will always put up a fight. They are unredeemable. But the man is redeemable. Why is that? What makes mankind so special that our Creator literally came to earth took on flesh just like us, lived a perfect life, died on a cross to take the punishment that we deserve. Why would he do that? I mean, these demons rebelled, right? They sinned against God and every, every person has sinned and, and falls short of the glory of God, right? What's the difference? Why would God give his life to redeem us but not angels? Simple answer is because we are created in the image of God. Humanity is God's greatest creation. He created us in his image. And we are all image bearers of God. Every one of us. Because, you know, we have sinned against God. We are now broken images. We, like we are those broken images that we're cracked. We're, we're broken. That's why God took on flesh. He came to earth, lived among us, and then died for us. The angels here are not image bearers. They are, not, they are just created beings and some choose to rebel. They had that free will. Like Legion here. And, and, and like Legion here, that when he or they could no longer torture or destroy this man's life, thought it would be a good idea to go and, and to destroy something else. He gave them permission. The evil spirits came out, went to the pigs, and they, 
the herd ran down and, and drowned into the lake. Evil only knows destruction. And uh, evil is, is going to be evil. Destruct, destructive people are going to be destroyers. That's simple as that. You want to know where evil abides in our world today? Look for destruction. It's, it's there. It's always somewhere where it's, something's being torn down instead of being built up. Things like monuments, right? We talked about this a couple years ago even with all this craziness. But it's not just monuments and stuff like that. It's not just... Evil can tear down people. Evil can tear down institutions. Look at our, our once wonderful places of higher learning, our universities, right? Places that used to, in the beginning, was seminaries to train pastors. But now all they teach is hate and destruction. Verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting in the boat, a man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. What we see here is the reaction of the people. Now you'd think that when God does a work in a person's life, everyone would be happy, right? But that's not the case. The guys whose job it was to watch over and take care of the pigs, they were probably in a heap of trouble now because all these pigs are gone. 2,000 of them, gone. It was their job to, to see over them. They had to go tell the owner or owners of these pigs that they just lost 2,000 of their, their, their property. The owners of the pigs had just taken a huge financial loss. The men tending the herd had probably just lost their jobs. Not everyone is happy for Mr. Insane that broke every chain that they tried to put on him. I mean, sure, he's no longer a threat to them. He's no longer a threat to himself. But we don't want this Jesus guy hanging around here any, around here any longer. What it was is that they feared the works of Jesus. They feared the works of Jesus. People have a problem coming to Jesus because they fear what Jesus is going to do in their life. I know I used to work with this guy and you know, he got all this religious stuff and now he's, he's, not, he's not the same person. That's right. Those things happen. I've, I've had that happen in my own life. Yeah. People are afraid that they're going to have to change everything that they do. Can I tell you there are true believers that can fear the works of Jesus? There really are. Oh, we want the promises of God. We want the security of knowing where we're going to go when we die. We want all the stuff that Jesus gives us when he meets our needs. We, can, we, we want the, stuff, the, the things that we can hope and trust in all that stuff. But what is difficult to trust in and what many believers have a fear of is the unknown. They fear the what ifs. What ifs. What if I really start to dig into God's word and I... I I really start to study it? What if I grow spiritually? And, and, and what if, oh my goodness, what if God would call me to ministry? What if God called me to the mission field? That's a little scary, right? And, and you don't have to be a young person to think about that either. I mean, I, I, knew, a, I knew a couple who, when they retired, they went into the mission field. They gave up everything. What if when I retire, God calls me to the mission field? And, and what would I do then? What if? I have a fear of that. What if I live out my faith and the people around, that, around me see that at my school or at my job and, and they make fun of me or they no longer want to be my friends? What if, what if I lived out my faith that way? What would happen? What would happen? And 
what if the pastor would ask me to lead a Bible group here at church, right? I know I'll just go so deep. I'll just do so much so that I will never find myself in that position. And that's where a lot of, a lot of you are. You want to know something that doesn't work that way. How do I know? Because I have said probably these same exact words to myself. And you see where I'm at today. All this to say, don't worry about the unknowns. Don't stress about the what ifs. Give yourself completely to the Lord and you'll never regret it and you have nothing to fear. Because people here, they exclaimed, and here's what they said, it's too much cost. We don't want Jesus, it costs too much. These people are afraid of the cost. Jesus already just cost them a bundle. They're afraid that if they keep Jesus around, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be too much to bear. So they ask him to leave. No, they beg him to leave. Go get back on your boat go across the sea, stay in Galilee, please just go. Too many people have an opportunity to have Jesus in their life and they just have shut him out. They want nothing to do with him. They've heard sermons about Jesus. They've read the Bible even and, and saw wonderful things that he does for people that, who trust him. And yet they exclaim, it's too much cost. I'll just have to give up too much. People think, you know, if I become a Christian, I'll have to go to church every Sunday. I'll have to start giving money to the church. They'll want me to come and they'll want me to be baptized and, and join the church. They'll expect me to serve at the church and a committee and, and work at the church, right? Thing is, I want you to know Jesus doesn't need anything from you. He just wants you. He just wants you. And it's not like you have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. People serve and people give because they want to. Not a have to, it's a want to. Because of the wonderful gift of grace that he has given them. Why do people serve on our committees that we've been talking about? They don't have to, they want to. Because God has given them grace. And people who receive grace, here's the deal, witness. Let me tell you about my Jesus. I love this part. This is the best part of the whole story. Verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So the question of the day is, have you received the grace of Jesus? Have you received that free gift? Has he taken the person you once were and has now transformed you into the person he saved you to be? Has he improved your life? Has he provided you with the blessing that only a loving God could provide? Has your trust in him given you a secure place to spend eternity? If you can answer yes to any of those questions, then go tell someone else. Go tell someone so they can have their life changed as well. That's the important part. Be like the guy in this passage. Honor the Lord by being obedient to him. Go and tell. Here's the thing. If you've, if you've been putting off trusting the Lord for your salvation, don't delay any longer. There's nothing to fear and everything to gain. So if the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart and you know you need to be saved, then just leave your seat and come forward and we'll sing as we sing our closing song. Also, maybe you're here this morning. And maybe you've trusted Jesus for your salvation already. But you know deep down you've been hesitant. You've been fearful of going deeper in your Christian walk. You've been disobedient. Maybe the call to something more. You can also come this morning as we sing and get that straightened out as well. Whatever your need, please come. You did that. Yes, you did, Angie. Praise the Lord. Let's pray.